For King and Country, the story of one soldier's service in the British Army, up next on Carib Nation. Welcome to Carib Nation. Many of us know that Caribbean nationals have served in the British Army. Many of our parents have served in the British Army. But we don't know all the stories. And today we have one of those brilliant soldiers who served in the British Army and is here to tell his story. And the book is called For King and Country. And we have with us his son, Gabriel Christian. And Mr. Wendell Christian, thank it's you. a great pleasure and honor to speak with you. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Gabriel, let me start off by asking you to give us a, a capsule of why you wanted this book done, why you thought it was important. Well, I think it's very important for any nationality, uh, least of all young ones like the Caribbean nations are, to have a keen sense of that history that produced the nation. And what is, uh, when, when we reflect, uh, when uh, Justice Irvin Andre, my co-author, whose father-in-law, Twistleton Bertrand, joined the British Army in 1944 and became the major of the local defense force after the war. And my father, who were friends back in the 1930s, when they joined the army, they were not even maybe themselves aware of the great tradition mm -hmm. that had in fact been one of several centuries of uh, West Indians serving with honor with uh, uh, Admiral Nelson at the Battle of mm -hmm. Trafalgar. There were West Indians there. Uh, in the Peninsula Wars, there were West Indians there. So the British West Indian Regiment had had a long and, 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 and noble history of service, even though in service of the colonial power. Mm -hmm. But what happened in World War I, we discovered, was that many of those soldiers later went on to great leadership mm -hmm. in the development of our nation states and our independence movement. Captain Arthur Cipriani in Trinidad came from the British West Indian Regiment from the First World War. Mm -hmm. Norman Washington Manley of Jamaica mm -hmm. was in the Royal Artillery. He was a hero and got the military medal. And then in the second war, we had a more amazing outpouring of leadership, uh, like that of my father and Mr. Bertrand. Uh, Some of our current leaders exactly. in the Caribbean. Norman Washington Manley, son Michael Manley Michael was in the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, Errol Barrow, Barrow was in the yeah. Royal Air Force. Milton Cato of St. Vincent mm -hmm. was in the Royal Air Force. Uh, uh, Edward Scobie from Dominica. And so, Pendeleaf. and then in Dominica, we had Pendeleaf and, and several others like Severin. So we find these people, like my father, uh, like Mr. Bertrand, like uh, Ulrich Cross, the Trinidadian ace navigator, 80 missions over Europe, hmm. distinguished flying cross, distinguished service order, pinned on him by right. King George VI, the famous Dudley Thompson, mm -hmm. who be be later became a minister of government in Michael Manley's government, was a flight lieutenant and became a judge. I'm sorry, he became a lawyer mm -hmm. at Oxford, after Oxford. Cross became a judge after the war, went on to, to serve with distinction in Trinidad and Tanzania and Ghana and Cameroon. So we have this great history. Great history of and, and really. need, That's right. We need to know it. We need to have it written. Yeah, it's, it's very important for our people to write our history. I think many of us have read history books, and of course there's no mention of West Indian people in the history books. We know that our fathers and grandfathers have served in the army because they've told us of their roles in the Army. I'd like you to tell us, Mr. Christian, uh, a little bit about your experience in the Army and your input in, in getting this book done, why you thought it was important to record your experiences and what you hope to pass on. Well, I hope to pass on the word discipline. Mm. Discipline is the word that I want to pass on to the uh, Caribbean nations, in that our young people today lack discipline. Mm -hmm. And if they had the training in the British Army, they would be a disciplined people. Mm -hmm. And I think if the people in the Caribbean would forget drugs and stick to other, other things that are meaningful, they would be a better country. Mm -hmm. 
I'd like to first set the stage by, would you mind telling us how old you are so that we can be I would like to know that I know to the, uh, 87. 87. I was born on the 5th of March, 1921. Yes. Now, um, when you look back, as you say, we, we, we've seen the, the change over time. Um, do you think that those leaders who got that discipline at that time and were trained in the British Army, and, and many of us have fathers who, who still ran their homes as if they were in the British Army. And I'm sure you're aware of that. Where do you think that breakdown came, and do you think that some of our leaders have, have uh, reneged on their responsibility, so to speak, and changed with the times rather than maintaining that system to keep the standards at the level that they should be, or is that colonial passé? I want to say is because of the, the British tradition, the, the, the discipline was installed in the people of the, that time. Mm -hmm. For instance, um, during the Battle of Trafalgar, mm -hmm. the great Lord Nelson, the greatest admiral in history, said that Britain expects every man to do his duty. Mm. And just before he was killed, he said, thank God I've done my duty. You see, that thing of discipline was installed in the British people, mm -hmm. and it carried them through the war. It is that. That's why we hear about the stiff upper lip of the British. Exactly. <laughs> that, that, that discipline, that, that uh, perseverance and, yes. and, and stamina. And in my home, as a married man, I brought discipline to the home. And my children sometimes tell me, Daddy, I'm not in the British Army. <laughs> and I say, well, anyway, you, you, are, you are in a disciplined home. And yes. I will mold you to be a good man. Yes. Uh, many of our, I think many of us grew up with parents who ran their homes like the British Army. British I have, Army. My father was one of those yeah. who uh, was very disciplined. Um, Gabriel, in writing the, the story, um, helping to write the story, what did you learn that fascinated you most? Um, uh, uh, there's so much information here that uh, we only heard the tip of the iceberg, I think, as young people growing up. Well, what was so amazing was the, was the enormous role. How many people know that a third of all the fuel used by the British Royal Air Force during the Battle of Britain came from the Caribbean, hmm. from Trinidad and Trinidad. from Aruba? And it was for that reason that the Germans sent wolfbacks into the Caribbean to interdict the convoys that were carrying those supplies. How many people know that 7,000 West Indians, 7,000 West Indians, served in the Royal Air Force hmm. as bomb aimers, as navigators, as pilots, as fighter pilots, ground crew, hmm. administrative crew? No other part of the world and no other set of nations, a group of nations or colonies, contributed more men to the Royal Air Force in World War II than the British West Indies. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing thing. I thought I knew world history, mm -hmm. but I found out how ignorant I was. Mm -hmm. I will give you another example. A gentleman by the name of Alex Gordon, Jamaican farmer, heard Winston Churchill talk about the fact that Britain will fight them on the beaches, fight them in the hills, they will never surrender, and went to the Daily Gleaner. I was reminded by the Jamaican ambassador, Mr. R. Johnson, recently, and said, look, England is going to fight. We must help. And gave 100 pounds. In those days, 100 pounds was a lot of money. Lot of money. And they started the Bombers for Britain Fund. And Jamaica alone, through the program promoted by the Daily Gleaner, bought 14 Blenheim bombers hmm. for the Royal Air Force. To the degree that Lord Biverook, the British mm -hmm. Minister of War, said because of the contribution of Jamaica, from then on, a squadron of the Royal Air Force will be forevermore known as Jamaica Squadron. Mm. And to this day, the Ministry of Defense of Britain will, on its website, notes in the Royal Air Force is a Jamaica Squadron. Really? There was also a Trinidad Squadron because Trinidad also bought planes. Mm -hmm. People from Barbados, Dominica contributed. And when the other colonies saw that these small Caribbean islands had started buying money and buying planes for Britain. South Africa, Australia, New Zealand picked up what Jamaica had started. Mm. So I say this to say 
We've we, been leaders all along. That's correct. We were leaders all along. Yeah. Now, there's something else that's very interesting. Marcus Garvey, mm -hmm. almost always in his famous pictures, wore a uniform. Right. He was never a soldier. Hmm. He was never even a Boy Scout that I know of. But we discovered that after World War I, many of the soldiers from the British West Indian Regiment, like Nimmons and Wellington, Wellwood Grant, joined the Garvey movement, and they were the ah. ones who made it so successful. And it was they were, the one, they were the ones who developed the Africa Legion, and that was a uniform that oh, Garvey had. So when you look at the success of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, it would not have been as successful, but for the British trained soldiers and sailors, and for the of Afro... Of course, that training they brought with them, That's too. correct. Yes. Also, the African-American soldiers, mm -hmm. many of whom joined in New York, in Harlem, after they had served in World War I. That was something that was totally... Mm -hmm. I, I had no idea wow. that this most successful Universal Negro Improvement Association owed a great degree of its success, not simply to Garvey, but to but the, discipline the discipline of the British, British Army, Army and the discipline that African-American soldiers had learned during their time in Europe as well. Yeah. I also... Uh, Guyana also had um, quite a role in this and t in the person of Cy Grant as, as the first black... Um, There's an interesting story. Cy Grant, who later became a lawyer and a television personality like his country person here, Darius Dean, <laughs> became one of the first officers in the Royal Air Force of Color. Before that, he was a color bar. But mm -hmm. when Britain needed help and the West Indians started coming and they realized they could fly planes and they could do all those things that they Hitler said... They had to change those rules. They changed those rules. He became an officer in a Lancaster bomber and was coming back from a bombing uh, of Glen Cuscatton in Germany and was shot down over Holland. Of the six members or so, only two survived. When the Germans captured him and they saw a black man, mm -hmm. they were shocked because German fascist, racist, supremacy uh, yeah. uh, uh, Anything, philosophy that was not said that group. black people were, were monkeys. Just, they couldn't yeah. do things like that. Right. So they didn't know what to do. So they took a picture of him and said, here we found an RAF officer of indeterminate race. <laughs> they couldn't say he was African or black or whatever because that would run counter yeah, to their philosophy. Their philosophy like and so yeah. these are the sort of nuggets that we find in this book that Justice Andre, my indomitably uh, successful legal mind and researcher, uh, found as well as, of course, the contributions we got from soldiers like Mr. Bertrand mm -hmm. and George Cross. Again, George Cross and Mr. Dudley Thompson were uh, very important in uh, that they were flying over Europe, so they saw much more action than those who served yes, in the British in Army, the Army in the Caribbean, like my father. Uh, Mr. Christian, tell me what was your most memorable time in the Army? You served, what, four years in the Army? Four years in the Army. Yeah. What, what was the, the most striking either event or period that you can recall? The most striking event I can recall is that I was in, stationed in St. Vincent and during my training we go to carry out army exercises and we carrying on attack and the, the name of the exercise I was carrying out was platooning the attack. We are attacking the Germans and then when they give the uh, when they give the order to charge, we burn it to burn it the Germans. Uh, we had to scale a fence, a uh, wire 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 a wire fence. Mm -hmm. And I, when I when I tried to jump, I got stuck. Oh! <laughs> I got stuck and I was hanging over on the other side and so on. My goodness! And when my comrades were coming to release me, the army con the army instructor said, "Leave him alone. He's already a dead goose for the Germans." Wow! And they left me. My goodness! Uh, hanging over. And then afterwards, after the after the attack was over, they came back to me and they released me. My goodness. That was my most striking event. I can imagine. That must have been one of the most terrifying moments. Yes. To think that you were left there uh, at the mercy of the enemy. Yes. Left there at the mercy of the enemy. Hmm. And they said, I'm already a dead goose wow. for the Germans. Leave him alone. My goodness. They knew, they, anyway, they knew that I would not have died because I was, you know, honey. Uh, yes, yes. My goodness. Um, also, something that isn't known, uh, as you pointed out in the book, 
um, when U-boats were sunk in um, St. Lucia, Saint Lucia yeah. we, we go back to when U-boats were sunk when the Americans um, were thought to be helping Britain and the U-boats were sunk then when the Lusitania was sunk. Well, Lusitania was sunk in the First War, the first world but war. they sunk the but Lady Drake and Hawkins and in so on in the world Second World. And it's, it's um, something that we didn't hear about, U-boats in the Caribbean. As I said, we heard about them in the First World War, yes. the Second World War. Right. We didn't hear much about that in the, in the, because it was thought that the Caribbean didn't even have the capacity well, for... Not, not many people know that the biggest oil refinery in the world in 1940 was in Aruba. Mm -hmm. Aruba's oil refinery processed, I think, 400,000 barrels of oil per day. Right. The biggest refinery in the United States at that time processed 150,000 mm. barrels. And then you had point 0.14 in Trinidad. Yeah. So after Churchill appealed to Roosevelt, after the Battle of Dunkirk, Britain was on its back. Mm -hmm. The Blitzkrieg, the German army had swept the low countries, had conquered Europe, right, Danny? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the British army, how did they do at Dunkirk? They had to retreat under heavy army attack. And, and how did you get the news? You want to tell uh, Doris about the news from Lowell Thomas? Yes. It came about the news, American news, that today the, we had Lowell, Lowell Thomas, he was a famous war reporter. Mm -hmm. And when Britain would say, today RF planes are over Berlin, ten, um, ten, all of us, we, bear, we bomb heavy, we bomb the heavy defenses, and all our plane return safely. Mm -hmm. That's the RF speaking. When Lowell Thomas, American version coming, today RF planes are over Berlin, 10 RF planes are shot down. You know, Britain will not, did not want to say the amount of our planes that are uh, shot down, as, as it would um, create, uh, to demoralize the nation. Fear, yeah. So they want to keep up the indomitable spirit and say, all our planes returned. Safely. War propaganda, yes. as usual. So one day he came over and said, "Today, the Germans are using a new invention. They're using flame-throwing tanks against the British uh, British Expeditionary Force, and nothing can save the British Expeditionary Force from total annihilation." Wow! And it sort of demoralized the British, mm. but with their indomitable spirit, they kept fighting they kept on. Fighting. And they were, until they were able to um, withdraw 350,000 troops. Hmm. So what happened was at that time Churchill appealed to Roosevelt and said we need uh, help. We need help. He said, give us the tools, America. Give us the tools and we'll finish the job. Uh -huh. And America poured in tanks, guns, food, everything. And interestingly and enough, came to the rescue, really. that's and what at the same time the Britain signed an agreement that they would give Amer they would give Britain America would lease bases in right. the Caribbean, yes. and by giving them and give them fifty American destroyers, and that's how the bases, the bases came, about. came about. In and Caribbean. the United States then chose a young Harvard University professor by the name of Dr. Eric, Eric Williams, Williams to be the Caribbean representat representative on the Caribbean Commission, mm -hmm. you, which was going to be in charge of administering those bases. Right. So you had bases at Chagaramas, mm -hmm. you had bases in St. Lucia, at Hiranara, Antigua. Antigua, at Coolidge Field. Grenada. Uh, um, I'm not sure they had one in Grenada, but they had about eight no. bases spread over the Caribbean. And in exchange, my father will tell you about the equipment they had in St. Lucia, what equipment was that and what, where was the food coming from? Our food was coming from America through V4, the American base in V4, St. Lucia. And they would, look, they would um, all kind of food stuffs you would think of, rice, flour, beef, eggs, jam, all kind of food. So when the poor people who were not in the army would be starving from food, the British army was well served. <laughs> As always. <Yeah. laughs> the British Army always made sure they were. And one of the things um, that I got, I thought of in, in, with this concept is um, the Caribbean leaders that we 
have had in the last 30, 40 years have perpetuated some of what they learned, obviously, in, in the British government. And to some people's, in some people's belief, to the detriment of, of the Caribbean. And I wonder, do you think that the, the colonial trappings that have been left from those who worked and served in the war, with the exception of the discipline, but there was a mentality also that seemed to have gone with that. And some people